Hello YouTube and welcome to the third and final reaction in the Kizumonogatari reaction series. Rocking the Cyberpunk shirt today, Edge Runners out now. Watch it at your leisure, it's very good. Uh, what else? Nothing else. I shaved, so I'm not as neck beardy. But again, that's not really relevant and I shouldn't stand on ceremony too long because uh, I've got a lot of comments and I've got a lot of Monogatari to watch today. So just going to jump right in and see what you guys had to say about the last movie. First comment here from Harry Codentinks. Be careful about watching the production stuff from Kizu. As you know, the movies were made long after the following season, so they might mention spoilerish stuff, not full on spoilers, but references to full events. So this has put me on pause. I will not look at that stuff anymore because I really don't want to be spoiled on the rest of the show, really. So thank you for letting me know. I'll keep it in mind. Gian Bueno had two comments here. I'll go through the first now. Hey, now we're finally getting to the part where I like to start throwing novel info and cut content around. Apologize if my comments from now on are more of the longer type. For starters, what put a hole in Dramaturgy's face weren't baseballs, but a shot put that were mixed in the batch as the baseballs. In the novels, Araragi even remarks that this could be stupidly dangerous when he reaches for them, but without the inner monologues in the movie, this is kind of hard to understand for what happened. They also cut this, but Dramaturgy talks quite a lot in the novels. He's the leader of the huge vampire hunting vampire group and invites Araragi to join them as their boss because of his crude power, which he promptly refuses as he wishes to become human again. Uh, as I mentioned last episode there, I felt like there was a lot of cut content, and this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about, where, yes, I could have interpreted the whole shot put thing, and I eventually did, but it's just not as evident because we don't get the Araragi internal monologue. Again, I still don't know if this is a good or bad thing. I think it's leaning a little bit towards worse on the Hanakawa stuff, just making that hit a bit harder. But again, I still got what the scene was going for, so it wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, I'll just skip ahead to his other comment here now as well. Just got home from work, and I guess this is as good a time as any to write another comment and go into a bit more depth about the vampire abilities in the Monogatari universe, because the movies make it seem like each of them had a special ability, with Dramaturgy turning his blades into arms, Episode turning into mist, and Kiss Shot creating clothes on Matt out of nowhere. And that's not true. It's not that one vampire can do one thing and another can do another thing. Those are the powers of vampires in general. Energy drain, charisma, regeneration, turning into mist, merging into shadows, shape-shifting, and matter creation. They just use the powers they prefer using. For example, Dramaturgy in the novel turns to mist right after this fight and disappears, besides obviously transforming his body to take the shape of great blades. All of them can use all these abilities, it's just a matter of proficiency and training. Shape-shifting and matter creation are harder to do since the user has to be in the right state of mind to do so or be able to mentalize themselves as such. That's why Araragi turns himself into roots in the novels. During the entire plot of Kizu, even a bit in Bake, he all the time says stuff about wanting to be a plant because he wants to be alive but doesn't want to the burden of being a human. Can't wait for the final movie reaction. Well, the reaction's here, so tick for that. And yeah, this is some nice background knowledge regarding kind of the Monogatari universe and vampires in general. Again, uh, Kiz and Monogatari kind of skips over this. Not that it's especially relevant for the story they're telling, but it's still nice to know. So going forward, I'll have this, you know, knowledge in mind. It can apply it to other vampirish, vampirish, vampirish situations. So yeah. Also, the stuff about the plant, I think there's some other comments talking about that, so I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more when I get to them. But thank you again for both of your comments. Fernando Lemus comments here. Also, that the question you had about Araragi didn't notice that Hanakawa liked him will be answered in Nekomonogatari, which takes place after Kizu, but before Bake. Interesting. So there's going to be a chapter in there somewhere. This is teetering towards spoiler territory, so just dial it back a little bit from there and we're good. I would imagine it has something to do with his self-confident issues and not even realizing that somebody could like him. You know, he's just a bit stubborn like that. Again, I don't know, and this is just me theorizing, and I don't want an answer to said question. It will be coming, and I'll talk about it when we get there. Just on that topic, what do I actually do next in my order? Next in my order is Nisei Monogatari. Interesting. I know nothing about it, so hope it's good. <laughs> the next comment here is from Alice Spain Suntaus. I'm going to keep going with that name. I have no idea if it's right, but I'm just going to keep going with it. Uh, Non-spoiler stuff off the top of my head from the novel. Could be misremembered. During the early part of the novel, Araragi laments that he'd rather be a sapling than a rock because at least it's a living thing but weak in regards to his usual petty nature. So in the end, he grew up to be a tree when losing his humanity and shape-shifting. The tentacles are indeed just roots. 
I think this is a very interesting kind of metaphor going forward. We're going to think about that a little bit more. This is this is some sort of stuff that would normally be in a monogatari monologue that has probably been missed here. Again, I think that one's a bridge too far for the average viewer to interpret that without this kind of knowledge. So that helps build some great meaning out of that last scene, right? This is kind of the final crux of the end of his humanity is him becoming this tree, right? So it's kind of like the end of his humanity giving forth this final burst of life, which is interpreted as the tree that he always wanted to be. The, you know, little sapling or bush that, you know, he thought would be better than his own humanity. Again, extreme self-loathing there. Shun, you know, informs some stuff going forward. So yeah, nice, nice context. He continues on here. The novel focuses more heavily on him buying the judo books to train for dramaturgy. He buys a baseball fantasy manga on the side, so he reads it after getting annoyed at the judo books. Then mid-fight, after trying judo stuff, grabbing him on the roof, he realizes that acting like a normal human is not going to work against an abnormal opponent, which leads him to use the baseballs instead from the battle manga. It was an accident that he had a shot put in the baseball bin and he didn't even realize after the first throw due to his superhuman strength. More useful to read fantasy battles when you're fighting in one. Makes sense. And I think that's a funnier scene played out like that, I think. that didn't really emphasize that it was a battle manga. It just looked like he was reading baseball tips as well, which is kind of weird. Again, the way it appears in the novels, to my knowledge, it seems a lot more writerly. So that's like a good setup. In a, in a novel sense, if you know what I mean. Like something that Araragi would do normally, something kind of nerdy, just to get his mind off something, ends up being important later. I oh, know, it just clicks a bit better for me, I think. Small things being referenced in the book later, but the adaption only kept the reference, not the thing referenced. I would also just mention, if it hasn't been mentioned already, that there's a full translation of the Blu-ray special commentary tracks out there for each episode of the entire series. It's dialogue between the characters written by Nisio Sin itself, reacting to themselves watching the episode. This is why Shaft gets a lot of Blu-ray sales, uh, amazing added value for fans, not to mention huge differences and fixes in the animation. So the, I'd imagine the version I'm watching right now is the Blu-ray version. Actually, I'm sure that it is. So I've got those animation improvements, which is nice. And yeah, I'll, I would have to check out the special commentary stuff on my own time, but that sounds amazing. I would kill for something like that for some of my other favorite shows. So it's so meta. It's another... You know, it's right in Nisio Isin's wheelhouse from what I've noticed. So, sounds like a real treat. Thank you again for both of the comments there. Uh, Matt comments here, Hanakawa hoping to meet a vampire to spice up her life and seemingly it coming true gives me Haruhi Suzumiya vibes. I can't help but agree. And uh, as a huge Haruhi Suzumiya fan myself, this uh, only, only gives me joy. Again, it's one of those very... Much like Haruhi, which is also very writerly and clever and all these meta kind of things, uh, Monogatari seems to be doing some similar stuff. So, again, very cool. I wonder, which one came out first? Probably uh, Haruhi, I'd have to imagine, but I don't know. I, don't think, I think it's a bit of a stretch to call it an inspiration. A comment here by NCUW, which just kind of talks about uh, kind of Shinobu's ability to generate clothes and dress herself and that kind of thing. She creates physical materials, which he doesn't say is especially important right now, so I'm not going to judge it as such. Just that we know when she generates those clothes in the last movie that it was just her kind of abilities coming back. There was a bit of discussion about the voice of Guillotine Cutter from TJ Gibson. He says that his voice act is the same as Yanagihara from Three Gets and a Lion, which I didn't notice initially, but now upon recollection, that makes sense, especially considering the studio shaft connection. Uh... I don't know what I was on here because I've, I've gone back and had a look at his mail and don't see anybody that I recognize. I commented there that uh, that it might have been the old guy from Slime Isakai, but I don't know. I didn't pay that much attention to Slime Isakai to really remember that. So I don't know. Maybe it's a weird like Mandela effect thing. I'm going to go with Simon here. As, as he explains in the start, he still doesn't know really how to say it. English is a weird language. I, I very much agree. Uh, Simon says... Hey, that's a bit funny. Simon says, Simon says, as you could see, people who remember more than me will write about the novel. So this time I have a question for you. Do you know how many episodes in the show and how many more girls in Araragi's harem? Now, this brings up a good point that I probably didn't bring up at the start of my reaction is that I know that there's also like, she's got like green hair and says peace. And I think that's 
who he's referring to in the end of the comment there. I don't know who that is. I don't know what her deal is. I don't even know her name, but I know she exists. So I guess that's a spoiler, maybe. <laughs> and she says peace. That's all I know about it. She says peace. So we're going to have to see that later. And to answer the second half of the question, I have no idea how many girls are in the show and I don't really want to know. I'd imagine they go into the sisters at some point, considering they're, you know, characters in the show and would need some expounding upon what happens in with them, unless they're just completely side characters and not relevant at all. But I wouldn't imagine that's the case. Anyway, we're going to see. I'm going to watch it all, so just chill on the whole spoiler front. Taris Andre says, Hanakawa is just a friend. Well, don't tell Hanakawa that, because uh, she doesn't know yet. But yeah, in this sense, Araragi only sees her as such at this point. I think this is more in reference to my comments regarding why doesn't Araragi know that Hanakawa likes him? Is he that dense? And then, yeah. And yeah, I'd imagine there's some discussion about that later in the series regarding why that is the case. Again, these are just hypotheticals and don't need answering in comments. Kramer comments on a lot of different things here. Uh, it says so that three legendary OSTs appear here, so the, the soundtrack's really good. I'm I'm with you. It is very good, even though I'm, you know, not looking into the soundtrack at the moment because of spoilers. The titles of the movies are based on the titles that Shinobu has in her like full vampire name, which makes sense. Shinobu's name was also explained during Hitagi Crab. Again, a lot of stuff in Hitagi Crab has since forth gone over my head because it was very early in the series and kind of was just letting things go. Again, that's kind of the rewatch value that you get with this show, um, I would imagine, and why you guys are all here rewatching it right now. One thing I'd like to point out is the whole reason Hanakawa was out late at night looking for vampires, almost as if she had a death witch, is because shit was falling apart at her home. Araragi is not the trigger for her stress, but it sure adds up. Yeah, I'd imagine that this is the case as well, considering she didn't know Araragi at this point, her family situation must have been weighing on her. Which, again, that was described as the impetus for her stress during golden week as well it was only when araragi got with senjo gahara that the stress increased again again that's the way i interpret it and don't really want correction on the issue unless it comes from the text itself the araragi transformation at the end isn't explained in the movies vampires have skills like dramaturgy heavy blade hands and episode being able to turn into mist araragi decided to transform into a tree at the end the book has a whole theme about araragi wanting to be a plant so that he doesn't have to do anything due to this fact he already visualized himself as one and he was able to easily transform into one that makes sense in combination with the other comment about the vampire abilities now that i have kind of that connection there as well so thank you also, remember that while fighting the rainy devil, Oshino told Araragi that at most he would be able to have one-tenth of the strength that he had during Kizu. So he is going to be very strong in this uh, next movie that we've got coming up. And the dramaturgy design in Kizu preview is very different, like the kind of starting part of Bake. Uh, if I go back and see that once I finish this movie, I think I'll see a lot of design differences, which only makes sense considering the time gap. Thank you for the comment, Kramer. Benjamin Lee has the final comment here. The lack of Araragi's inner thoughts in the movie gives me the impression that the movie isn't trying to paint Araragi as the sole main character. In a sense, both Hanakawa and Shinobu are equally as important as Araragi in the movies. By removing Araragi's inner thoughts, the movies portray these three characters as a trio of main characters, which is interesting because this is the third instance that we know of that exclusively involves Araragi, Hanakawa, and Shinobu, the end of the Bake arc, and the Golden Week incident. By putting all three of them in the equal spotlight, it shows how they change each other without having an unreliable narrator feel to it. At least that's how I felt when I watched Kizu. So if the thing that I'm predicting that happens in the third Kizu movie happens, and Shinobu is is bad, and becomes bad, I would still argue that there's a little bit of Araragi personal POV to it all. Because I don't think Araragi interprets the situation of strengthening up Shinobu as dangerous as it actually is. And us, the audience, didn't interpret that as well because of how innocent Shinobu seemed early on. She seemed very funny and kind of bubbly and smug in a kind of charming kind of way, you know? So in that sense, Aragi is being charmed and with the audience being charmed as well. That's only if this whole big bad thing comes to fruition. If not, then I probably agree a little bit more with your comment. Either way, I think that putting the focus on these three characters in these specific scenes is very purposeful. You know, the end of Bakemonogatari, the Golden Week stuff, and the Spring Break stuff happening right now. 
Benjamin then links a time code. The way I interpret it is that Araragi always cared for her enough to lose himself ever since she became his first friend to speak to. In his encounter with her before the Traumaturgy fight, Araragi doesn't exactly know how to express his care for her and truly believed that by hurting her like that to keep her safe would have been the best thing to do. And seeing the lengths Hanagawa goes through to preserve their friendship puts her on an even higher pedestal in Araragi's mind. At least that's how I interpreted it. Ultimately, Hanakawa dying in order to help him was the last straw that made him almost lose himself. In my opinion, it doesn't feel that jarring that Araraki would react this way despite only being friends with her for a short amount of time. Put it this way, I'm imagining that Hanakawa is in a lot of Monogatari going forward. I'm imagining that if somebody that was a Monogatari fan watched this at this point, they assumed that they wouldn't need reinforcement that Hanakawa and Araragi have a strong relationship. So... I think it makes sense outside of the movies, given the context. I don't think it makes sense within the movies. Again, this could be cut novel stuff, and it's a real, real nitpick. Again, the movies are still fantastic. I just think we needed a couple more scenes between Hanakawa and Araragi to really make this stuff hit. He continues on. P.S. Man, I've been trying my best not to write really lengthy comments, but watching Kizu again after such a long time gave me a whole new perspective on the story and wanted to talk about it a bit more. But I guess the length is just the result of me not being able to articulate my thoughts well enough, I guess. Smiley, kind of tongue out face. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't really mind the long comments. I was teetering on doing the thing I did last week where I kind of just summarized my thoughts and gave people credit that way. But, uh... But I didn't, I went with the full read method, and we'll see what that does to the editing time later today, but it is what it is. And if you want any credit in this situation, I think you're a lot better at writing than I am anyway, so I enjoy reading the comments, so keep it up, guys. I don't really mind the long ones, so keep keep it up. So just going to jump into a, oh, I say quick, but it's not very quick, recap of uh, the last movie. The film opens with a flash forward, much like the first movie, to a fight that happens later in the film between Araragi and Dramaturgy. Flashback to present, with Araragi reading various books on different fighting styles, like Akido and baseball. He is approached by Hanakawa, out on one of her usual walks alone at night, and hijinks ensue. The tone of the scene then changes, and Araragi asks why Hanakawa is out at night with a vampire on the loose. She says that she wants to meet said vampire. Araragi flips out at Hanakawa because of this as kind of a defense mechanism for the both of them. Hanakawa, he wants to protect her physically, and Araragi wants to protect himself emotionally. This causes Hanakawa to run away as Araragi's like really mean as he goes in to face Dramaturgy alone. After an extended fight sequence, Araragi wins by throwing a shot put into his face. Uh, Dramaturgy supplicates himself to Araragi. As day breaks, it is revealed that Hanakawa saw parts of the fight and questions Araragi about it. After Ar Hanakawa shows Araragi her panties, he agrees to take Hanakawa kind of into this world. They get one of Shinobu's limbs and feed it to her, and it causes her to age up, which again answers kind of the mechanic around the limbs. There's a great kind of brotherly conversation then between Oshino and Araragi, which then leads into a steamy scene between Araragi and Hanakawa, where we see Araragi's ripped bod and have some great kind of romantic comedy-esque banter. Araragi then prepares for the fight with Episode, a vampire hunter with a massive crucifix as a weapon. Episode teleports around and beats the shit out of Araragi for a while before Hanakawa shows up and tells Araragi his power has to do with mist. Episode hears this and brutally murders Hanakawa, sending Araragi into a rage. He lures Episode to a stadium and uses the dirt from the pitch to subdue his mist power. He pins Episode down and strangles him almost to death before being stopped by Oshino, who tells Araragi how to save Hanakawa. Araragi bleeds onto Hanakawa, causing her injuries to heal. Then there's a really long, bittersweet scene between Hanakawa and Araragi, where they say their goodbyes for now, which me describing it won't really do it justice here. Go back and watch it. It's like 10 minutes and probably one of the best scenes in the show so far. However, Hanakawa is then captured by the remaining vampire hunter, Guillotine Cutter. Oshino says that Araragi will need to give up his humanity to save Hanakawa. Araragi does just that, gaining superhuman abilities and easily dispatching Guillotine Cutter and saving Hanakawa. However, he is left lamenting the fact that he gave up his humanity and is now just a monster. 
again, I've cut a lot of the nuance from the last movie, but I guess that's the real, like, kind of Sparks Notes kind of summary there. Just some predictions for the next little movie here. Uh, we'll have some kind of conclusion to it all, which is good. I like conclusions, so this should be good. I think this movie's a little bit longer too, which is uh, which is a bit fun. Because I watched the preview last week, I have a general idea that Shinobu will now be the big bad, I think. I could be wrong there, but that's how I interpreted it anyway. Also coming from the preview, there will be something about Hanakawa boob fondling, so please look forward to that. I think another comment said that the text at the start of the first Kizumonogatari movie implied that there would be some kind of bad or bittersweet ending to this all, so that is in the brain as well going forward. And I think Oshino Meme will have at least one cool scene, which isn't really a prediction, more like a guarantee. So, looking forward to that. Just some show stuff before I jump into the third movie. If you like the video, consider liking the video. If you like the video and want to see more, consider subscribing to the channel. Comment below anything you thought about the episode, anything I can do to improve my presentation. And follow for follow on Twitter at the moment. So follow me on Twitter and I'll follow you back and we'll do the social interaction thing and it'll be awesome. Right here, keen to jump into the third Kizumonogatari movie right now. Right here, got the movie up here ready to go. The time code on the movie is 1 hour, 22 minutes and 10 seconds. I'll pop that up on screen now. Uh, that should still be tall enough to see the subtitles, but again, your mileage may vary. Yeah, and I don't see any need for any further ado, so I'm just going to jump into the movie. Going to give it a 3, 2, 1. 3, 2, 1. Okay, Japanese flags again. Interesting. So I'm imagining this is just after. It's the red. Oh, look at the eyes there, that's a bit crazy. It's a bit mad. Okay, both arms. And this this music again as well. So Guillotine Cutter isn't dead? Yeah, we won. Nothing bad is going to happen now. Yeah, the scene's very glum, isn't it? Mm. Ominous. I'm at my own wake, in a way. Drama dude. Mm hmm. Good thought. Ooh, is it weird on the cigarette? I thought the idea was that they teamed up. <laughs> what a name. There she is. She doesn't seem that villainous. Hmm. What is this? A heart. It's 
So you kept that. It's a bit weird. I like this is kind of like power levels, you know? I mean, I thought that was obvious enough. He had it. Mm -hmm. There's some implications about taking her heart as well. Oshno Mami could do lots of stuff. Yes. Would have had to. Yeah, I don't know if that's particularly wise. That shot looks amazing. What the hell? Mm. No, she's not. Yeah, I mean, the movie's going to end in, in five minutes, right? He doesn't look like he's rejoicing. Yeah, for blood. So again, it's only direct sunlight, so he could go outside right now because it's raining. Hmm. I don't know if he's talking about hungry for food. <laughs> mm, how so? Okay. Classic line. No, he already left in the other one. Though I failed. Mm. <laughs> Do you know? Are they balanced, though? The cold-blooded chapter. What kind of not human? Not hot-blooded? Oh. Great. Hello, Shinobu. <laughs> There's kind of the feathers from all the... um. I guess they were crows. Wonder what's gonna happen when she gets her heart back. Mm.
Who you now? Hmm. She did give him her word. About what? Oh. I love this helicopter technique they got going on. Very fun. The spotlights there were interesting too. It's like they're they're like faking being discovered. It's very weird. I don't know, you called us up here. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Okay. Well, you're being a bit, a bit hasty. Always fighting. Hmm. What should we talk about? A certain man. Okay. Good point. Sorry if there was a cut there, I had to go do something, but should be all right now. Okay, so long in the past. Mm. Nihon Jin. Hmm. Is he dead? Yeah, I would have imagined so. Mm -hmm. I don't remember that, but sure. Sick. Heart spin. <laughs> Do they now? That's good. What do you mean I cut you? <laughs> Cutting you was a great delight. Very anime. <laughs> Oh, it's like that one thing in Elden Ring. 
that weapon that I used. <laughs> This looks awesome. Mm. The immortality is a bit of a curse, huh? How do you kill yourself as a vampire? Into the sun. I don't know if that's literal or metaphor. Okay, so there might be some resentment about your old relationship applied to this new one, perhaps? Hmm. Sick. Looks awesome. <laughs> Everything you do is insane. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be happily ever after. Yes. It's like she's looking at herself though. Now then. Well, the way he's walking there is kind of a nuts. So have you gotten stronger? The hard lessons I learned were not in vain. Hungry, huh? Hungry for what? They're really letting it hang, huh? <laughs> I have a little bit of thought about um vampire charisma here as well. <laughs> it's a very weird name for a company. Yes. Oh. 
It was certainly an interesting one. <laughs> this isn't how it went at all. Hmm. There's the repetition of the first shot in Kizu. Or one of the first shots. This certainly wasn't how it went. And then this shot again. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. There you go, she got herself a feed. Who are you eating there? The way she talked there, kind of with a mouthful. Very good. Oh, that was sick. Oh, look at the blood. Is that guillotine cutter? Yeah. She got him. Oh, I CG head. That's a bit fun. Walking rations. No. No, you said bad about Hanakawa. What is this? <laughs> uh, bro, he's getting creepy past it. Ah, Jeff the Killer. Ugh. I thought he didn't eat anything. So is that like pure bile? That's pretty gross. This guy's all right. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, I guess anything tastes good when you're hungry. Maybe not human meat, for me at least. What do you mean? She's a vampire. <laughs> I get that this is like his first realization. I wonder about leaving no bones. Be hard to eat bones. But she, I guess she did eat her own limbs. Oh, interesting. Hmm. So kind of like, if she feeds, it's by extension my fault for whoever dies. And that kind of goes events he's very like self. Interesting. Yeah.
Or kind of the crucifix there too. In the light. Which I, means I need to do the same thing. I want to literally eat Hanakoa. What's up? Hanukkah's dreams be like. Oh, okay. Hanukkah's dreams don't be like. She just he just ate her face. That's kind of nuts. Oh, he's losing it. Is that why the other guy killed himself? You certainly did. In a fit of rage. Yeah? She put it back in? I hope she picks up. Would kind of ruin the vibe if she didn't. I'm not sure this is especially wise. This this uh this classroom here. I don't even know. It might be a storage room. It reminds me a lot of Bakemonogatari. Three. Yes. What do we do now? Something nasty, huh? Now he seems to be himself still. <laughs> Yes. I love the lighting here. Like already. Such a great conceit for a scene. Look at this. Look at you two. Feeling a bit hungry there, champ? No, I just ask you and you do that for me. <laughs> That's normal. You want gentle man. It's very different. Yeah, maybe. Or maybe something else will happen. Oh, she's kind of like hopping again. Hmm. This is nice. How'd, how'd she interpret that? That that's what he was thinking. Yeah. Is that why she's amazing? Hmm. Yeah. What 
what part of you dying? Your humanity, maybe? Well, of course it didn't. You can't see in the future. Yeah, they did. Oh, somebody died because of me. Kind of tying into um, Nadeko Snake in a way. Yeah, for her. But not for me. I've still got my human side left, right? I love that um the shot going that way too. Ooh, with the wings. Sick. More unfair for you. Hmm. She have three hands there. That was kind of clever. Oh, look, oh, the hands there, that's sick. Does she actually have wings now? Because that's kind of mad. There's got to be another way. Mm. Ooh, kind of the red of maybe the Japanese flag. Ooh, okay. Physics. Hmm. Ooh. Not generally. Hmm.
didn't quite understand that line. Might have to go back. No one could stop her, huh? Yes, as she wanted to do. But is this really maintaining the balance? Hmm. It's kind of tragic for um, Shinobu. Hmm. Is that like the Olympic fire? It's kind of crazy. Hmm. Kind of becoming one of the vampire hunters himself. Will you now? Yes. How so? Uh... How will you help? Uh, I'm sure Araragi can. Mm -hmm. Is this the breast fondling? Uh. <laughs> I hit you the first time. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't seem, you know... The solution doesn't seem attached to the uh to the problem. <laughs> okay, so she was seventeen in the last one. Five years a limb. Yeah. He's given him his all, isn't he? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> yeah, she's thinking about it. Stop sniffing. Hmm. Chotomate. Yes. What are you guys doing locked all alone in the gym room? In the dark, with only a torch for a light source. Those glasses look nuts. Look mad. Yes. Are we going to watch her change in full, like, 4K? That's awesome. Monogatari's gonna monogatari out there. Mm hmm. Yes. 
Okay, so it's kind of like an undershirt. Yeah, right. I'm ready. <laughs> so. <laughs> it's like Mario sound effect. Yes, they're boobs. Did he send? Did he tell Sendra Gahara about this, like later on? In my opinion, like I've spent sixty seconds fondling Hanakawa. Sendra Gahara would kill him. Yeah, that'd be kind of weird. His hands off like that's very funny too. <laughs> oh, he's shaking. <laughs> this is a long scene. I'm very glad I won't have to analyze this one in much detail. Yes, back a little bit. Yeah, almost there, big dog. All you're doing is making it worse for her. No. Daijobu. Yes. Yes, mm-hmm. If you have to run the, um... If you have to run the police say this so and get sued or or go to jail, then it's probably a bad idea. Yes. Supplication. I guess true. Aragi, you're being weird. This is I'd rather I'd rather him eat her face, honestly. Oh, the fucking breath. Mm hmm. Yep. It's an honor. Arag, you being weird. I guess it's okay if she's into it. Sadiq. <laughs> I grew. Hey, yo. They just got a mind of their own, don't they? You should be put on a list, Aragi. Hmm. This seems to be going beyond your initial contract. The music here is funny too. <laughs> I've lived my life for this moment. It's all been leading up to here. <laughs> He's had a fucking epiphany. Like right now. Oh, was that in his head? Ah, I see. Okay.
<laughs> a fairly like me can't even guess. Mm. <laughs> oh, she turned the tables. What if I massage your shoulders instead? <laughs> oh, he's so pathetic. Mm-hmm. The rest is online. That doesn't happen either. Well, I guess in a writing sense, he can't know. And they'll be together forever, surely. <laughs> Hello. Hello, nuclear bomb person. Versus, yeah, that's her name. I'm not going to read it out, but it's her name. Okay, great, we're here. Is this the same soccer pitch where he fought um, episode? That makes sense. It's like an Olympic stadium. It's kind of mad. Hello. So did he put out the bat signal? We're going to get a fight now? Mm. Mm. But you will kill again, and I can't have that on my conscience. No. I don't think I will. Hmm. My human side, it's still there. As represented by Hanakawa, of course. Even the most evil human ever. That's that's very interesting as well. I guess he never really thought about it. It's kind of a catch-22, isn't it? Interesting, okay. Mm. That's that shot's kind of amazing too. Oh, that's just cool. Mm. 
Hmm. I think you should evacuate the area, Hunko. I think that would be wise. I mean, she's kind of right, though. Again, that's the great criticism to kind of Araragi's thought process. Mm-hmm. Sick. Okay. I had to mute the group chat, which is on in the background, kind of ruining this moment. Yep. Okay. There goes his head. <laughs> That's a bad start. We're off to a bad start. We can recover. Again, these effects kind of undercutting these serious scenes. It's a great technique, I think. <laughs> oh, that's fun. It's kind of like um a gymnastics routine. Yeah, he grew back his limb, as he is wont to do. There goes her head. <laughs> this is fun. What's up? She like towers over him too. Yes. What next? Oh. Is that the blood like pulling up? Well, oh, she's loving it. Yes. Shall you? Did you? I had that same question, actually. Is she mic'd up? How does she hear? It's like a Dragon Ball Z fight with a bit more blood. Oh, that's fun. Oh, look at his skull. Hey, yo. <laughs> I punched the skin off your skull. Uh, hello. I'm back. <laughs> he looks like fucking Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Oh. The crowd cheering is very fun. Oh. Okay, that looks sick. Cheese grater in his head on the side of like the concrete.
<laughs> it's like a human rocket. They're having a lot of fun here. With how like fucked up people's like bodies can get and have it still make sense. There you go, perfectly reattached. Yeah, he turned himself back around. Hmm. It's got a bit of that devil man run going. Yeah, I guess once you've done something, it stops feeling that way. Hmm. Sick. Oh, this is awesome. Oh my goodness. Hey, yo, they put their whole pussy into this one. <laughs> the kind of design change there is mad. He gives me like MHA vibes right now. I don't know why. Oh, that cut was a bit weird. He, I have to realize that he's not really doing damage to her. Oh, I just put my head through your chest. <laughs> Good thing he got his boob training. Oh, and his nose. Fake boob training. Boob training in his own head. Oh, which you can't even watch. <laughs> Would they have announced the, um, the Tokyo Olympics at this point when this came out I think they would have that's very fun yes hmm Again, I don't think it's your place to be, but what is your point? Mm -hmm. The triangle between the characters here is great, dude. Oh. Or just the head. I'm going to drain her? <laughs> the baby lives are starting to freak me out a little bit. <laughs> this is fucking mental. She loves it. I become small. Good feet shot. <laughs> oh, day breaks. Has something happened?
What is your point? Oh, she looks mental. She looks ill. Hmm. Well, you kind of hesitated. Mm hmm. 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 Yeah, what is your point? Hmm. Well, I mean, you said you get sick of immortality eventually, right? Yeah, I remember. Hmm. Meaning and death. These aren't tears. Ooh, that's a great line. Tears of humanity, right? That's kind of what they're getting at. <laughs> Walking rations. <laughs> Is that what she thinks every time Hanakawa rocks up to the abandoned cram school? No choice. Hmm. We'll find a happy medium, I'm sure. Again, Aragi can't do that. Is 
Is it? I don't think he's built like that. It's very different how his philosophies changed, right? Throughout this fight. Because he would have easily killed her in the throes of battle because he knew he had to. Also, yeah, I forgot he's naked. It's very interesting that this is in a stadium, right? What a great performance. Of course I'm here. Washington Meme gets one cool scene. <laughs> Hell yeah. Did something good happen? Mm-hmm. He's like a um he's like a tickle me elmo. Domo. Mm. Yes. So what's the deal? What's your problem? <laughs> Give us a happy ending. It's his nature, isn't it? Ha <laughs> ha. All four of you, huh? Yes. So very far on one side of the spectrum. Pseudo vampire. <laughs> we, we we'll go splitsies. So 
so you'd need to give your blood. You don't, do you? Hmm. He doesn't work like that. No eyes. This reminds me of a tantrum in the um, subway. Blanc. This reminds me of Sendra Gahara and um, Kambara. Hmm. 8th of April. Hmm. So again, like a true prequel, right? The reveals were more emotional rather than what actually happens. Because, yes, this fits into what we know. The scar. Hmm. The scar stays, huh? I'm pretty close. He does do that. His healing's pretty good. Oh, this song. I love the shot. Interesting. The flags again. Keep coming up. Hello, Shinobu. Where is she? I, again, I like how they're just in like a lecture hall. Kind of like how he was sitting in the stadium, huh? Yes, you are the character design that I know. So can she talk? Or does she just not talk now? I guess this gives great context to why she looks at all the different members of the Aragi harem in this way as well. Oh yeah, I guess she could keep going and suck it all out, right? But she never does. kind of is actually hmm and is that the right thing to do
Again, this thing about Aragi and compromise, right? Hmm. This song's great too. Kizu. And like a symbiotic relationship. Never tell anyone. That's it. Oh, and then this song again. I get what they mean by kind of a bittersweet ending, huh? But that was really good. <laughs> As I was kind of talking about before, it's, again, with a prequel, we know what happens, right? We we have a start point and end point. Even though somebody's talked a little bit about this kind of an individual chapter between this and when Bakemonogatari starts, that we'll see later, we still know where we start and where we end up. The drama then comes from why the characters did what they did. I think that's where it becomes all the more tragic, especially with this kind of backstory character we learn about with Shinobu and how a lot of that baggage translates to her relationship with Araragi now. Again, kind of like a truce, right? Can't kill each other. but also can't live apart from each other either. Wow, oh, this is gorgeous, this arrangement. Yeah, I don't know what else to say other than it was really good. The fight was extremely creative that they did. It didn't feel like a lot of content in the movie, if that makes any sense. But I didn't mind that at all. I thought it was actually pretty good. A good choice. Because if you're recapping this movie, right, it's essentially what the opening scene with Oshino, then the scene on the roof with Shinobu, discovering Shinobu ate guillotine cutter, the scene with Hanakawa kind of in the basement, but that encompasses a lot of different elements the fight scene with Shinobu and then kind of a res resolution there and then kind of the epilogue stuff. So there isn't much there for an hour 20. But again, I didn't really feel the length. Just good. Again, an hour 20 isn't very long, but still. Oh, the voices. This reminds me a little bit of Nier. I guess considering how much of the language in Nier is based off French as well. Yeah, listen to, uh, what's it called? Ashes into Dreams from Nier 1. Such a great song.
And again, talking about the song's kind of talking about this symbiotic relationship, right? You are my universe. This arrangement's really good. I'm wondering if there's anything at the end here. Maybe a little Sendra Gahara tease or something. Because at this point, I haven't seen Sendra Gahara for like a month, which is kind of weird. Haven't really caught up. <laughs> what else about that movie? They really like boobs in this movie. The boobs were gone all over the place. Whether it be Shinobu's or Hanakawa's. And again, like one commenter alluded to, there's kind of this relationship, right? Between kind of Hanakawa, Oshino, Araragi, and Shinobu. Kind of they're all connected in, into this weird thing. Connected through knowledge of this event that happened. I forget, has he told... I don't think he's told anybody about this backstory, but I could be forgetting. Yeah, does Sendra Gahara even know about the blood-sucking stuff? Again, it's unclear, and I don't really want to know either way, but interesting. think kind of Araragi yelling out there. It reminded me of how good the voice acting kind of is in this entire series up to this point, right? Like Hanakawa's VA was really good this set this uh kind of um this kind of episode. Whoever they've got in for Shinobu, somebody mentioned that it's maybe the same voice actress as the person in Tatami Galaxy. I think somebody said that. Either way, they're doing a bang up job. Just fantastic. And yeah, the yeah, the Shinobu voice just kind of the range in it as well. Is that the end? I think it is. And there we go. It's the ending of Kizumonogatari. Let's hop in for a little bit of analysis on that, shall we? So I think I've said a lot of what I wanted to say in kind of a wrap up sense in kind of the ending of of that movie there. So I might just jump straight in and have a little look at scene by scene so I can kind of break it down a little bit more. Pop that up on screen now. And yeah, just going to go through and pause when I see stuff I want to talk about. Coincidentally, I want to talk about something that is on screen right now. And that would be these flags. The flags come up a lot through this movie throughout the whole Kizumonogatari kind of trilogy. It's interesting that now this can be interpreted as a little bit of a... A lot of the last fight scene is kind of informed by the Japanese Olympics, which is a very, which a bit of a strange choice, but yeah. So this kind of nationalistic imagery kind of makes sense now. I'm trying to tie that a little bit more into the themes of the show. I guess there's some stuff about the sun, which comes up quite a bit. Kind of the old kind of thrall, the old kind of servant. Dying from the sun, I think they said. And then there's something to the effect of uh, vampires not being able to live in the sun and all this kind of jazz. So Land of the Rising Sun. I don't know, that's kind of a weird connection. But they do keep coming up, and I'm wondering if anybody in the comments has any thoughts on that, because I think it's interesting. I like how the first line of the movie is, is that it? Because that's kind of the audience's question going in a little bit, right? Uh, if they hadn't been spoiled by this point. Like, the enemy is dead. We We killed them. We are victorious. Why hasn't this ended? I think that's a little bit curious, a little bit meta. And yeah, this scene kind of goes into, kind of sets up a little bit of the plot stuff going forward. So for a start, Araragi kind of has the question, well, it doesn't really make sense. Why was Shinobu at her full power able to be defeated by these three vampire hunters, right? Why were they able to steal the limbs of her? I guess they ganged up, but none of them seemed particularly strong if I was able to dispatch them very easily. And we get the answer. Oshino Meme has her heart. 
Again, this is probably rife with symbolism that I'm not getting as well at this point, but it's another element of her that was stolen that was now given back and now she is stronger than she was when she got defeated by the three vampire hunters at once. So it kind of got this power levels thing going on a little bit, which I like. Speaking a little bit more on the heart, the heart given back to her and then her immediate infatuation is the wrong word, but the revelation of her love for Araragi as a servant and this kind of thing, right? He gave her her heart back. There's something there, I think, in the old symbolism department. Anyway, the setup now is that Oshino Meme is going to go away. Araragi is going to be left to his own devices with, with Shinobu. And we're going to see what happens there. Again, Oshino Meme, he's always observing. He's, he, he doesn't he doesn't really interfere unless he feels like he has to. And again, another pathetic fallacy in this scene, kind of the ominous setup of the rainy kind of depictions all around. We see Hanakawa in these random shots walking home in the rain as well. Something is not right. And again, at the end of the movie, contrast it there, we have the sun kind of breaking through the clouds. It's a, you know, hopeful, but not perfect. Kind of like I would relate it to, did we do a similar thing in Nadeko Snake? where he kind of woke up and it wasn't the usual routine. It was just kind of cloudy outside when they were wrapping that up. Now, it wasn't a Deco snake. It was Subasa Cat. Yes, I remember now. So it's it's interesting that they associated both of those with this Hanakawa Shinobu Araragi story. Again, this, this now gives a whole lot of weight to all the stuff that happened during Golden Week and then all the stuff that happened during Subasa Cat as well. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's definitely a connection between those three. I think kind of this shot here can be my last little love letter gush about this kind of production style they've got going on with the kind of rendered 3D backgrounds and the 2D animation put on top. Just looks spe spectacular. It looks almost real, which is the best compliment that you could give it, actually. Now, it looks better than real. It looks like stylized reality, and that's what you want. Yeah, endlessly impressed with the production of this. Uh, I can't wait to read the production notes and all that kind of stuff that's been recommended to me. I'm just going to probably put that on hold until I'm done with the series now, based on the comments of a few people. Unless people explicitly say that it's not spoilers, even then I probably still wouldn't trust. I don't know. I really, I'm really enjoying Monogatari, and I just don't want to be kind of future spoiled on anything. I love the reveals. One other part I forgot about the 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 kind of opening scene there is the implication of Oshino Meme knows what's going to happen. He knows that Aragi is eventually going to get hungry. And when he gets hungry, he's going to, I don't know, discover some things. Again, Oshino Meme is very smart, almost inhumanly, improbably smart based on the story. So I think he kind of knew some of this was going to happen based on Aragi's demeanor. Again, he just kind of lets it play out. He doesn't spell it out too much, even though I picked up on it pretty quickly. They wouldn't be talking about hunger unless it was vampiric hunger, of course. Shinobu gets her body all back together. Finally, at last, she feels complete. And uh, it's kind of contrasted with these crows flying into the room that then turn into doves, or at least change color. And we get all these white feathers going on. Again, it's kind of the... Because we've seen a lot of crows in the previous entries, and it's kind of juxtaposing with that. And, you know, the switch there from when she was not whole to when she's whole. It makes sense. Araragi brings up to Shinobu, hey, when are you going to turn me into human? And she's like, oh, right, that. Now that's got some added context now that we know what she was trying to do the whole time. So when she takes him up to the roof, it's kind of like, I just want to be whole again before either one of us has to die. You kill me to regain your humanity or I kill you and keep going on my way. Or maybe she's decided on her own death at this point and she's just waiting for Araragi to make the move. So this scene here, it's it's like, it's the calm before the storm, you know? They, well, she knows that they're not both making it out of here, if you know what I mean. So she just wants to prolong this nice moment that they're having for now as much as she can. So we as the audience interpret this right now as she just being whimsy that she got all of her body back. And I think that's part of it, but it's also, I want to save this moment. Or somebody else could have some entirely different theory about it as well. Either way, it's gorgeously animated. Um, if we just see a little bit in um, kind of fast motion there. Yeah, it's very well done. I love the spotlight technique, especially later on when they use it. It's great as well. They keep doing the helicopter shots as well. 
this in combination with Monogatari's thing about only showing the characters that matter. There's never people around. You know what I mean? There's never the threat of anybody being discovered because nobody else matters. It's only the characters involved. And then in combination with kind of this helicopter technique, this kind of like news footage, this kind of we've discovered you, it's just very interesting. Again, I don't really have a deduction to it all, but it's curious. Araragi gets to asking about Shinobu's life before. I spent it fighting folk like those three. It's basically all I've done. She then gets to talking about her old kind of partner. Not partner, but servant. A certain man. Was he like me? Your race was the only common thing between you. Your humanity. Well, I mean, race. Yeah. Race can have a number of different connotations there. They're both Japanese. Is that what she was talking about? But I think you could easily twist it to talking about humanity as well. Again, I don't know the word for race in Jap- Japanese, so maybe she says Nihonjin there. I think she does, actually. Maybe I'm grasping at straws a little bit, but I like to think it's humanity as well. Why did he kill himself, right? Why wasn't she able to realize that that he wanted to, to do this? He wanted to kill himself, right? Was she, had she lost that much of her humanity from when she was human that she didn't even consider it anymore? She'd killed so many humans up to that point that they were just disposable. Again, all these questions, right? Really gets the mind racing, Kizumonogatari, in my experience this far. Well, I say thus far, it's done, but you know what I mean. Scar Story, Story of Old Scars, written by Nisio Isin, illustrated by Ueda Hajime. Just going to look up Ueda Hajime quickly. A Japanese manga artist associated with the Monogatari series. Seems to have done some work on Fully Cooly as well. But yeah, mostly with the Monogatari series, and it's kind of responsible for this kind of art style that we see. I'm guessing in the Bucky Monogatari ending as well in the in the first ED, or only ED, I should say. Kind of yeah, this the kind of eyes on the on the female characters. I don't know what else I'd characterize it at. It looks very flat. Is the other thing I would note. But yeah, it's very good art. Yeah, I'd, yeah, like it looks like the first ending, so that makes sense. They kind of bring up the sword, and I thought the sword would have a greater impact when they started fighting, if that makes any sense. I thought it was a bit of a setup there, but she never ends up using it. I guess it's more of a memento surrounding this, you know, past servant that she had, and that's kind of its significance to the plot there. Or it comes up later. This is a better shot of the character design as well. Again, just gorgeous. The colors there, the kind of hairpiece, the straight lines on the hair great too and then they're kind of talking about uh this character committing suicide i still don't know if he has a name kind of the past servant boredom kills just a few years after he became a vampire he chose to die so he wasn't that he wasn't a mortal that long to where boredom would start to take effect if you know what i mean again it was more to do with the moral implications of killing all these people and the atrocities that he's done and his humanity starting to shine through. This can be seen in contrast to Araragi's actions later in the story when he tries to find a compromise through Oshino Meme. And yeah, the implication of this as well is that he put himself out into the sun and then just died. And obviously didn't regenerate. He threw himself in the sun as if showing off. Yeah. And then another implication you could take from it, I hadn't made another kin afterwards. She was so distraught by this. This tore her apart a little bit. Caused her to maybe regress even more to her monstrous side, to the vampiric side. I didn't want to feel that kind of human connection again. Until now. Until I was, you know, trying to kill myself essentially in the subway. And then you came along. Tragic. It really is. Tragic. When kind of all the lights came on and started raining like this. Just such a gorgeous sequence. It's almost silhouetted here. And yeah, you almost for a minute you think these two could coexist. This could be a happy symbiotic relationship between these two. They could both be happy in this situation. Instead, Araragi's conscience comes through and we end up with a situation in which both are unhappy. Very clever. Did your first kid not want to turn back into being a human? Back then I couldn't turn him back into one even if he asked. I couldn't even fathom giving my own life up for somebody else. I think what she's saying here. Again, I could be misinterpreting. Until now, until I've met you. That's nothing if not love, right? Aragi suggests grabbing some food. 
before she turns him back into human. She's tr- still trying to stall, obviously. I do feel hungry, too, since I suddenly came back to my full state. Yeah, okay. So he, you know, does what he does, goes get some Seven Eleven or whatever, just goes get some snacks, maybe a, you know, bento or something like that. But she grabs a different snack. We kind of get this scene here where, you know, he has really rosy memories of their time together, right? I had a little theory about um, her vampire charming him here a little bit, but I still don't really know how that charisma ability works. So this can only be reflected as his real thoughts of what went on, right? Again, very flowery. I'm sure somebody could do the Hannah Kotoba there, but not me. Then we get the repetition of these shots here. The repetition of kind of the overhead shot looking down, reflecting kind of the first scene in Kizumonogatari where he's walking scared through the abandoned cram school after just turning into a vampire. Here, he is happily rushing up to meet his master, right? Until all that tension is cut away by the realization that she actually eats people. Again, he explains it like, I always knew, but I didn't really think about it, you know. I didn't really think about it like that. Vampires, you know, suck blood and eat humans, but, and I knew that. But I didn't really think about the implications of it. I think that makes sense. He got ahead of himself in a way. One thing in particular I'll note is I love how the blood kind of smears across the face there. So it's like crayon. Looks awesome. Very monstrous. Like she doesn't even give a fuck. Like she she doesn't even think that he would give a fuck either. <laughs> I will say that his like CGI head is a little bit goofy. Especially considering we have so many head models later in the show. Is this a specific choice to kind of create more distance between kind of a real corpse and the fake corpse as we see later? I don't know. Weird one. I like when he's coming to this realization, he kind of has this weird dream sequence, especially the part with the baby here. Like, like what are we doing, guys? <laughs> Very strange. Or like the baby imagery in this uh, this part of the movie was, or this segment of the series was very weird. Kind of when he's growing back his baby limbs later on. Strange decision, but I can't say I don't like it either. Araragi projectile vomits everywhere. Well, you know, Shinobi's cute. She's just eat, happily eating this human. I mean, he probably deserved to die anyway. He was the worst of the three, but, you know. I guess seeing anybody eat somebody else would be a little bit disturbing to me, I think. So here, this is where Aroragi kind of starts to come to the realization of what he's done, right? Results in him kind of messing up this room. And this room serves as an extended metaphor later on where we see Hanakawa producing the only light left in this broken, dark situation. Very clever. And he is, he's wrecking it, right? It's, everything was in order, everything was right, and then it all comes crashing down. Quite similar to a lot of the stuff we've seen in Bakemonogatari surrounding the different metaphors surrounding rooms in the um, abandoned cram school. Just makes sense. But yeah, what is this realization that Aragi comes to? It's that by saving the one life of Shinobu, by doing all of that, by collecting all the body parts, by fulfilling his little quest, he is by proxy dooming people all across the world for eternity to be eaten by a shinobu. And eventually eaten by me. Because I am now a vampire as well and I will need to feed at some point. This results in him obviously realizing, oh, if that's going to happen to me, then I have to die. I can't, I can't live like this. I can't... I can't let myself live at the detriment of other people, if that makes any sense. That's just against Araragi's code. This combined with the turmoil he's feeling regarding Shinobu at this point, uh, and what he's done to resurrect her in a way, and what she will now do to other people, it's, you know, it's all too much for him. He needs he needs some help. Again, the crucifix on the, on the roof there, a little bit loaded, especially... When talking about themes of self-sacrifice, having a crucifix has certain connotations. Anyway, I like it though. I like the placement of it anyway in the scene. It's got an actual, uh, what's the word, diegetic location? Is that the word? Or am I being too snobby? <laughs> anyway, this was a freaky scene, kind of Hanako on top of him, kind of a loving embrace in a way, right? Start to kiss and then let's see if we can get a good shot of it. He comes to his own senses and kind of rips her face off with his teeth, leaving nothing but a skull left. Brutal. So again, Hanakawa 
in the film is kind of a representation of his humanity, right? This whole theme about friends making you lose your humanity and needing to save friends, making you less human. I think that's thoroughly debunked by the end, considering at his lowest moment here, he looks for this friend and she eventually turns him back to the human side. And then again, we can interpret that human side as life instead of death as well. So it's a good thing that she messed with his phone again. I wonder when she did that. I didn't really see that. But uh, she put it. She put a number back in. I guess that's when she realized that he only deleted the number out of spite and would probably need it again at some point. So yeah, he was ready to die right here by himself. He was going to. He went to his for his phone to call Hanakawa to, you know, let her know that he's going to die. But instead, he sees Hanakawa's name and it inspires some hope. Calls her over. It's a really great moment in retrospect. I really love it. This scene in the kind of this gym room goes for. It feels like a very long time. It feels like hey, they probably could have cut some parts of it, but I digress. But yeah, this stuff here is definitely worthwhile, I'll say. And definitely the conversation with Hanakawa later on as well. Keep that. Maybe less of the boob stuff, even if it was a bit funny. So again, we get one of our trademark kind of 10, 15 minute conversations with Hanakawa. I won't go into all of it here, but she starts off by kind of playing it a little bit cool which is fun here, kind of trying to introduce the situation. Plops the torch down eventually. She just creates a great atmosphere for the scene. It's a great creative choice. Both aesthetically, thematically, you mustn't die, you mustn't. That is just running away. It's kind of Hanakawa talking him down from the brink. Suicide is just running away. It's committing another sin on top of the sins you've already committed. The real answer would be taking ownership over it. And as we eventually get to the end of, we're going to try and take down Shinobu right? That's the best we can do, right? That is the most, like, trolley problem-esque solution to this problem. She will no longer have to kill people to eat if she no longer has to eat. Again, that's not the solution we come to. Again, I like the solution that they find a little bit better, even if it is altogether still really tragic. I just want to say that her wings are really awesome and how she hangs upside down like a bat. Also, there's also the implication here that I never realized that the vampire hunters were on the side of humanity all along. Again, there's something to the, the, the vampire charisma there as well, as well as being her servant, of course. I love this little technique they use here. So she has more and more arms grabbing him as she gets more and more reasons for him to not commit suicide. This one hand here particularly grabbing his heart. It only shows for a split second, so you kind of like look at it for a second and you're like, did she have more hands there? And then you realize it's purposeful. It's like, yeah, that's kind of brilliant. Again, Hanakawa kind of brings up this theme that keeps coming up, this I would die for you and that being attached to humanity as well. Isn't that similar to friends making you less human? Don't friends also make you more human? Isn't it human to want to give your life up for somebody else? This, of course, is informed by Hanakawa saying, that she wants or doesn't want to be eaten by Araragi, but if she has to, she will. It's combined with this kind of strange visual metaphor here that I'll try and find. Oh yeah, and she just said the line, I'll, I'm just your friend as well. I don't know what this is. <laughs> she kind of runs naked through it and kind of breaks through. I don't know. I think it works, but it's just a bit strange. If somebody could kind of has any theories about the symbolism there, that would be appreciated. I love this here. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give my life out for just anybody. It's because you're a friend. And one life should be enough to save the one of you. And again, this light that Hanagawa has brought into the room, it expands more. The whole room's lit up. Again, it's almost heavenly. And then we pan up at the cross. That's nice. Hell yeah. Yep, so you mustn't die. Aragi's thoroughly convinced. So what must you do? You must take her down. That is the only solution that we have left because you are the only one able to take her down. You may be the only one able to stop her. We kind of get a little flash forward here to the kind of Olympic motif we got going on. There's kind of the Olympic flame in the background. He runs a 100 meter sprint right towards her. Then Hanakawa says, if you have one request, what what would it be? I'm, I'm able to do anything for you. I'll do anything to help. Araragi takes advantage of the situation. I kind of like Araragi's justification here. Kind of, she has big boobs, and if they're all flopping around all over the place, I'll get distracted and potentially lose. So I need to get used to boobs first, and then I'll be okay. <laughs> I like how Hanakawa's like, he goes to repeat it, and then she's like, yeah, I heard you the first time. Is that really necessary? Probably not. And as we later learn, you know, 
it wasn't. We get a very long, essentially dream sequence in which Araragi kind of has his way with Hanakawa. I keep saying, Araragi's being really weird here. And of course he's being weird. It's a dream sequence. So they didn't really jump the shark that much. Eventually he pulls out. He's like, I can't do it. I also thought that if that scene was real, uh, that Senju Gahara would know about it eventually because she's good at that. And uh, she would murder him. Um, he would be dead. He would be dead in present time. But anyway, I'm pretty sure I can skip over most of it. I like the I like the fake out joke. Other than that, I think they take it a little bit too far. But you know, it's Monogatari. What are you gonna do? People pay people pay for their ticket for a reason, right? And the realization, like this is what my entire life was ending up to, kind of banging Hanakawa. It's like, nah. And then he's groveling on his knees, like, I'm sorry for asking you to do this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Then she calls him a coward, and yeah, it's it's fun. These kind of uh, characterizations there are very good too. When he asks the like, what do you mean shoulders? It's like, and then by the end she's like, yeah, that's definitely the same as touching my boobs. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they get their jokes off. It's funny. I'm not going to be a stick in the mud about it. <laughs> Just think, you know, it's a bit gratuitous, but it is what it is. This is cute too. And I wanted to highlight this. This is This is some great ship material, you know, if it was real. Then our kind of final battle starts in a way, right? It starts from Shinobu kind of admitting, like, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that you felt that way initially, blah, 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 but you'll get used to it. Are you still going to be my servant? He vehemently says no. He's very opposed to her at this point. I need to kill her to save other people's lives in the future. Again, similar to Nadeko Snake, right? He can't, he can't live knowing that the consequences of his actions would lead to the death of another, no matter who that person is. And I find that very interesting. And that is continually being challenged by all these different perspectives. Is he always going to get these compromises every time? Or, like in the Deco Snake, sometimes shit happens. Sometimes he was willing to put his life in the way of some random person, some random evil person, and then somebody pulls him out of the way. How does that relate into the friendship is makes you less human, friendship is a weakness kind of line that he believes? I don't know. Fascinating. So Araragi kind of says his piece, and then Shinobu hits him with a kind of another bomb, right? I knew I was no one special. You would do it for anybody. Again, this is tying into a lot of themes from Bakemonogatari as well, right? And I love this is kind of a... You can kind of directly compare and contrast this scene to the one with the flowers before, where he sees the different versions of all the um, all the Shinobus. You were only kind to me while I am weak, but now I am, when now I am strong, you want to cut me down. You would have helped anyone in trouble. Oh yeah, Hanakawa was also watching this entire time and I just felt nervous because I remember what happened with the episode, right? I was just like, oh yeah, she's going to get like bopped at some point, just randomly. But similar to the fight with episode, she comes through with some crucial information towards the end, which is weird. It's, 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 it's weird for Hanakawa to come to those realizations and inform the rest of the group. It's not really her style. She's she's more of the data collector. She only knows what she knows. She can't really interpret that information into anything greater. But maybe I read it incorrectly. Anyway, moving on. And then we start fighting after, you know, Araragi finally hears what humans are to Shinobu. They start scrapping it out. Die my master. Die my servant. It's all building up. And then boop. Araragi's head goes flying, they undercut it, it's got a, you know, stupid sound effect. And yeah, this fight ends up being very goofy. Very similar to Kizumonogatari 2, where they kind of put these, you know, goofy sound effects and have very goofy things happen during these dead serious sequences. It's good for a bit of levity, and I kind of really like it as a technique, it really gives it a lot of uniqueness. It isn't like a fight in like, I don't know, Fate or something, where the fights in Fate are, you know, they're really good looking but they're also deathly serious. I like this for a bit of a change of pace. Now comes along a very creative sequence. Uh, I won't go into all of it here, but fantastic. All the heads rolling all over the place, all the limbs flying everywhere, the running of Araragi with just his torso while he's kind of, uh, bottom half of his body is running along as well. Just creative, very awesome. There's kind of the revelation here that Shinobu was a human once in the past. So why can you see humans this way? I mean, it's the length of time, right? She's had to do it for so long that she lost that humanity along the way, especially so isolated. Nobody helped her anywhere along the way at any of these points. Why would she know the good parts of humanity, right? 
she has to be convinced again of the good parts of humanity by Araragi's actions, by his self-sacrifice down there back in the in the subway. You could see that reflected by kind of these shots, right? Where the kind of old servant from way back is also in the subway as well. Again, directly comparing and contrasting these two. My old servant chose the other way out. He chose suicide. Where Araragi's different. The only thing they share in common is their race. <laughs> Clever. Uh, I don't know what they did in this sequence, but it looked incredible. I think I mentioned in the reaction that they put their whole pussy into this one, and they certainly did. Um, it's, again, very, very, very impressive animated sequence. Probably the highlight sequence where this, they kind of have this really like kind of sketchy art style. Just looks awesome. Especially the Araragi running stuff looks fantastic. Yeah, the this stuff here, like holy shit, it looks good. Like the amount of movement here on Araragi is kind of mad. Is this another relation to the sun thing going on? They got this phoenix kind of dive that that, that she does. I don't know, grasping at straws. <laughs> anyway, like this stuff looks sick. Right here. You know what I mean? Yeah, just one of the most impressive sequences in the show thus far. And a really great end point for Kizumonogar 3 from a production standpoint. Just a real highlight, real treat for the eyes. Here's where Hanakawa starts to figure out what's wrong, right? One other thing I'll note quickly is that they're using a lot of crowd sounds. They eventually use some audio sample from the, I think it's an older Olympics back in Japan. Um, again, tying it all to this kind of Olympics theme. And again, I can't really find a connection there, but uh, but I digress. I guess it was on people's minds. Uh, but yeah, here's where Hanakawa realizes something. She's like, she's playing with you. Shinobu's playing with you right now. She's going to create an opening at some point and you're going to kill her and she wants that to happen. She wants you to return to humanity and kill her in the process as a final gift in a way, right? Originally, she was afraid of dying. Now she's no longer afraid of dying. Yeah, here's where the, the audio sample starts coming in as well. And Shinobu realizes that Hanakawa knows and eventually tries to attack Hanakawa. Keep your mouth shut, walking rations, which is, you know, pretty brutal nickname. But Hanakawa remains determined. She's going to yell it out. <laughs> Araragi jumps in the way and gets exploded. That's one of the highlight sequences as well. It's awesome. And in the process, what does Araragi do? Start to suck the blood of Shinobu. Again, but this is exactly what she wanted. We kind of see his baby body grow out here. Weird. That's why she's so happy, right? That's why she's laughing. This is what she wanted to happen. So we're kind of left with this very feeble uh, Shinobu that we have left. What's wrong, my servant? Aren't you going to finish me off? I'm only half-drained over here, right? And then the question, how did you intend to make me human again? By you killing me, of course. By draining the energy back. Again, I don't know how that in, in exactly works to create him human again, but, you know, it is what it is. It's like, I couldn't do it. I just lied to him to get my limbs back. She would have to be complete and be sucked like that for him to become human. Okay, I get it. And here it is. It was the first time in some of my life somebody held me. I was deathly afraid of dying, but somebody brought me back to life. Somebody gave their life for mine. I decided to die for you like you decided to die for me. Again, this relationship between these two. Symbiotic, right? I couldn't give myself up for him to turn him back into human, so I wanted to rectify this mistake. I love this here too. Such a crybaby, my pathetic servant. These aren't tears. This is blood. Blood is flowing. This feeling of sadness, this feeling of self-sacrifice, all these human feelings. Associating it with the food of the vampire, right? I would only be crying like this if I wasn't a vampire, if I was a human, right? Blood is flowing in you too, isn't it? You're still a bit human. You've still got a little bit of human left in there. And here comes another ultimatum. If you don't kill me, I'll kill a thousand people right now. Or not right now, but over the over the time. Is that is still okay with your code? Would you kill me right now? Or will you let me live and I'll kill much more people? Again, she knows Araragi's code. She's giving him an ultimatum. Making him decide. But Araragi chooses, fuck that. 
I love the come on, come on, come on's here though. Though she's just kind of like goading him on still. It's great. But uh, yeah, uh, Aragi chooses to shout out for Oshino Meme instead. And uh, yeah, this is kind of his cool scene that I predicted. Of course he didn't go away. Of course he wasn't gone. He was never gone. He asks, tell me a way out of this that's a happy end for all of us. Oshino Meme says, there is no happy end of all of us, but I can make it a bad ending for all of us. I can definitely do that. It solves no one's problems. But it'll make it so that your conditions are fulfilled. And this is where, you know, the story that we know kind of jumps in. Now, now I understand why she's a ruined vampire, right? She's almost nothing. She's got just enough vampire left in her to still be alive, right? And Araragi is the opposite, right? He's got so much vampire in him that he's almost a vampire, but he's still somehow human, right? Sucked her to the point where she's almost dead, and she needs to rely on him for sustenance. But only give her enough over time that she won't, you know, get all of her power back and keep doing everything, right? Keep keep killing people and doing all that kind of thing. So now we reinterpret every single scene where Shinobu kind of sucks the blood of Araragi, right? We reinterpret that as she could, at this point, take him over. She could suck all of the blood out of him and go on a rampage, but she doesn't. He subsequently could kill her at any moment and be done with the whole blood-sucking thing and be done with their whole relationship together, but he doesn't. They stay in this limbo. It's their little kind of secret. It's their little kind of connection that they have. Again, they have a pretty strong connection based on all the evidence, right? You can kind of see why Shinobu side-eyes all these different characters in the Aragi harem, for lack of a better term. You know, she feels like she has a special connection with Araragi that nobody else shares, but so does everybody else, of course. I don't know, just fascinating, right? And that's the kind of ending we're left with, right? She disagrees. I don't want to live in a state like that. I don't want to. She starts throwing a tantrum similar to the tantrum that she threw in the subway, right? Yelling out to die instead of yelling out for somebody to save her. But Araragi doesn't fulfill the wish. Instead, they kind of embrace one more time and we cut away to another date. I loved this ending scene. The song it plays, it's just beautiful. It really is. And, uh, you know, kind of get our bright outlook going forward again it's still a cloudy day it's not a perfect solution in fact it's a bad solution for everyone involved but it still fulfills Araragi's code and that's kind of what matters to him so we get kind of the first glimpse of their new relationship here she sucks his blood she doesn't talk anymore you know she's shinobu the shinobi that we know now i love this little line here by uh by Oshino Mame as well it's like the disillusionment of seeing a cute kid and eat a mouse that's kind of what happened to him you were the pet owner, or she was the pet owner and you were the pet, and now it's the opposite, right? I can never look at her the same way again, but still, you know, harbor, harbor love for her, like a pet. I don't know, it's a weird metaphor, but I think it works. And yeah, it kind of ends here. I won't get fed up with it. I'm doing this solution because I like it. This is what I wanted to happen, according to my code of ethics at this point. We hurt each other, then we lick each other's wounds. Now both damaged, we seek out each other. If you die tomorrow, my life ends tomorrow. If you live today, I can survive the present too. The story of our damaged selves starts now. I think the word kizu was used here as well. So I'm wondering what kizu means in Japanese. I, I have no clue. But uh, yeah, Monogatari's story, I know that. So this is the end of our kizu Monogatari. I guess we were the kizu Monogatari all along. That's where we kind of end. One last smile of Araragi at Shinobu, then into the ending, where they repeat this song again. It's just a really beautiful version, really beautiful orchestral piece. And I love the, the version of the child singing as well, right? As you can interpret it as this is Shinobu kind of singing to Araragi, or maybe to her old servant as well. I don't know, you could take it a lot of different ways, I think. But yeah, that was fantastic. I really loved it. Again, I think it has a few pacing problems, but uh, you know, it is what it is. And I, but I think the highs of the movie kind of overtake any of the little kind of criticisms that I would have for it. Um, thoroughly enjoyed myself. The production of it is absolutely insane, as it is throughout. But uh, 
at the same time, I'm ready to jump into kind of present time. I hope that's what we're doing now anyway. Back to the end of Bakemonogatari and going on from there. Either way, I'll be back with, I don't know, some amount of episodes next week and uh, jump back into some more Monogatari. But before I finish proper, I'll just do my show stuff one more time. If you like the video, consider liking the video. If you like the video and want to see more, including the Tatami Galaxy and Penny and Stocking on the channel at the same time as well, consider subscribing. Comment below anything you thought about the episode, anything I can do to improve my presentation or anything else really, comment below. And uh, I'm doing follow for follow on Twitter, so follow me on Twitter and I'll follow you back and it'll be awesome. Anyway, thank you very much for watching the Kizumonogatari trilogy with me and uh, I'll catch you guys next time. This was a real treat. Thank you very much. I'll catch you guys later.